Hello, welcome back to Building Integrity. I'm your host, Josh Porter, and today we're gonna to be talking about punching shear, uh, what is it, why is it important, um, and what does it have to do with the collapse at Champlain Towers South? So the first thing I wanna do is get right into it and start explaining and teaching you guys what punching shear is. A lot of people have mentioned it, um, maybe on other YouTube channels and stuff, but nobody's really actually explained what it is. Okay. So uh, let's look at this um, as a section of your building. And so uh, here is the column. And this is your slab. Okay, and I'm not gonna do this for everyone. I just wanna orient everybody to what we're looking at. And then this uh, material up here, which we're gonna ignore really for most of the rest of the presentation, is what's called your overburden. It consists of your... Um, pavers, your sand, your topping slab, all of the non-structural dead weight that would have been put on top of this uh, uh, system. Now, this is a simplified reinforced drawing. I don't show the reinforcement coming at you out of the page, uh, but I do show the rest of the reinforcement generally as it was specified on the drawings and the plans. Um, the reinforcement for the columns at the pool deck area is a little difficult to find. So for, for, for example's sake, I just drew it with four pieces because we know from the photos that there was four rebar coming up from the column into the slab. Those rebar would have generally been bent over um, and lapped. We call that lapping with the bottom steel. The drawings specify that the building was to have a mat of bottom steel. These were number four bars. And depending on which drawing you look at, some of them were 12 inches on center, some were 13 inches on center, so I'm not going to get into that. But you have this bottom mat of rebar, and then you have an upper mat of rebar. And we've looked at that in previous videos where we're talking about the punch-through shear and stuff like that. And I had a structural engineer uh, email me from a couple videos ago saying, hey, I don't see where they used shear reinforcement. So back in the late 70s, they were working under ACI building code 77, and uh, they, the, a lot of buildings were not designed with what we call shear reinforcement. So if we look at punching shear and we, we look at how we would expect this column to punch through, we can see we have these shear cracks that go right through the slab at these locations. And in a modern uh, plate slab construction building like this, we would add rebar um, or we would add some sort of stirrups or we would add um, what they call a shear reinforcement. A lot of it's prefabricated now. And you would add that in order to add steel across that crack interface, okay? We're talking about this crack interface. And it creates a big shear plane that in order for this slab to fail, you've gotta, you've gotta break the concrete, break the steel. It's a lot of material you gotta get through. And so in modern buildings, we would add shear reinforcement. But back then, a lot of buildings, most buildings with plate slab construction didn't have this additional reinforcement. So the engineer uh, who designed the building specified top reinforcement. And for example, at a lot of the locations, maybe he specified that he wanted 16 number five rebar. Uh, and the number five just tells you how many eighths of an inch it is in diameter. So that's a five eighths diameter rebar. He wants 16 of them. Well, in his general notes, he says that he wants 25% uh, of whatever the rebar he specifies at each column location to be located directly over the column. So in this case, you would expect that there would be, you know, four rebar, because that's 25% of 16. So you would expect four rebar to be placed over this. And his intention, I believe, was that this rebar uh, would have to be, would, would come through this shear plane and would provide extra resistance to for punch through um, without actually providing specific reinforcement for punch through shear. Now, the looking at the, the, the photos that were taken immediately after, there are some interesting oddities. If you go back, you can see that the shear plane that I'm showing you should look generally, you know, like this uh, uh, inverse cone, if you will, okay? And we see a little bit of that uh, in this drawing, but really only in one tiny location. So this is the, this is the, I'm oh, not drawing this photo. So this is a photo of, of the wreckage immediately after. We zoom in on the left side and you can actually see that, that sort of angular shape there where we would expect that shear to have happened. Um, but then oddly enough, you see it actually cuts into the column on this side, which is a little strange. All right. And then also, if you look at like this column here, which punched through the slab, you see no material at the top. It's, there's, there's nothing up there. It's just a, 
It's almost like a pencil pushing through a piece of paper. If you look at the right side of that photo, kind of zooming in, you can see what I'm talking about with uh, the tops of these. You would have expected to have seen some sort of uh, a material at the top of these columns. You would not expect to see them as they as they are 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 uh, exhibiting in this photo. Okay, and you can see you've got it on this column. You you can see punch through from this column, and you got another column over here. None of them have the telltale shear head at the top of the columns. Well, I want to show you some historical photos to show you what I'm talking about. So here's a case of punching shear at a parking garage uh, in the UK, and you can see just how massive the shear head is on this thing and the amount of material that was left above the column that, that had to break. So the, the bigger this is in, in circumference, the harder it is for that slab to, to or the harder it is for that column to punch through the slab and for the slab to fall down. Here's another historical photo. And again, you can see that telltale head on top of the column where it's sheared, okay? And then here's another photo, historical photo. I don't know where some of these are from. I, I pulled them off the internet, but I wanted to use them to explain. So you can see the top head here. You can see every single one of these columns has a chunk of reinforcement and concrete uh, at the top of it, right? But we don't have that in, in our photos. All we have is just this straight, almost like a pencil head profile, right? Coming up through the, through the slab. And I'm gonna explain this uh, more in this video uh, why I believe this is the case and it sort of fits with all the other pieces of the puzzle that we've gone over in previous videos and what we know about this building and this project. Okay, so let's talk about how the engineer designed it. We know that there is a bottom mat of steel. We know that above every column there was supposed to be top reinforcement. Okay, and then we also know that there was some sort of rebar coming up from the column, but we would not expect this to be uh, very robust and it wouldn't typically uh, bend and lap very far into the slab. All right, so I'm gonna switch us over to sort of an isometric view so that we can get our bearings. So looking at this thing in 3D, okay, the, the gray area is obviously your column. And these lines represent like a, like a, like a see-through section of your slab, okay? And then this, of course, is your shear head. Now, in order for the slab to fall down and collapse over this column, everything in that shear head would need to break, right? I mean, you've got to break it all the way around the column in order for the slab to fall down around the column. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at, well, what is going through this shear head? Because when you go back and you look at this, it's not necessarily clear, like, how much rebar are we talking about, right? So here is a crazy mess of a picture showing all the rebar uh, per the plans, except actually I didn't show some. I didn't show the rebar coming up from the column, and I didn't show the rest of the rebar that would have been over the column. I only showed the four bars, which are in blue. So the blue bars are the top reinforcement, and everything else is the bottom. Okay, so I showed the four rebar that would have been on top of the column each direction. This is kind of a crazy picture. We don't need to get overwhelmed with it too much, because what I did was I took each of the rebar that actually passed through the plane, the shear head, and I transpose them as simple uh, uh, locations, okay? And so uh, so here's your, your shear head, and here's all your locations. We zoom in on that a little bit, and you can actually see the blue bars, okay? All the blue, again, equals your top reinforcement. The red, interestingly enough, is your bottom reinforcement. So all that red that you saw in the uh in this picture here all this red on average only one maybe two bars of those are going to pass through you can see where that bar passes right through your shear head the rest of that rebar actually isn't even over the column so the bottom reinforcement is practically useless for resisting shear as far as its percentage of the of the contrib contribution it provides and then these little purple guys i don't think they add a lot but they are the locations where we know four rebar came up from the corners uh, of the columns and then kind of hooked sideways through those locations. So that would be like the column hooks. Okay. Now, the uh, the the uh, 
thing that I'm contending is that if, if, if all this rebar was here and it was all working and it was all doing what it was supposed to be, we would end up with large chunks of concrete on top of these columns when the, when the slab came down at the pool deck. But I have reason to believe that we didn't get really any contribution from the top rebar, all right? And there's a couple reasons why. One, we know that the deck had no functioning waterproofing. Uh, we also know from my video that I did walking through the garage that the underside of the slab was exhibiting stress cracks, cracks that in my opinion were indicative of a slab uh, under distress due to overloading or a uh, lack of capacity to handle the load. And then the third thing, which we're gonna talk more about in this video is the core samples that were taken. Okay, so let's get into the core samples because we've gone over those other items in other videos. And here is a, a nice big close up of core A. Okay, and uh, core A, I believe was taken over by the planter boxes. Okay, in fact, where they took this photo, they actually set it up on the knee wall around the planter box wall and, and took a photo of it. And some things I want you to note in this, um, which I'll actually show you in the next one before I, before I get into this picture too much. Okay, so here's the notes that the engineer provided when, he, uh, when him and his staff or his, his contractor took the cores. First thing he mentions is that he has one and a quarter inch thick sand in pavers. That's not actually in this photo, okay? So we can disregard that line when you're trying to look at this photo and understand what this photo is. You've got less than an eighth inch thick waterproofing. So you've got this like little layer of waterproofing right here at the top of the sample, okay? And then you've got one and three eighths inch thick tile and mortar layer. That is right here. So that's this layer right here. We'll just call it tile, but it's tile and mortar. All right, that's that first one and three eighths inches. Now what's interesting, think about it, they actually waterproofed over tile and thin set. I mean, I can tell you if you tie, if you try to waterproof over tile and thin set, your waterproofing is going to be ruined virtually within weeks of installing it. If you can even get the job done without the without the waterproofing membrane failing, I've I've, I've I can't really think of a job where I have seen or a building that I have seen. I mean, where I have seen somebody waterproof over uh, tile in this capacity. Kind of crazy. Okay, so then. Uh, so then he says he says the mortar might be a, a sloped topping. We're not really sure, but that 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 that, that I, I drew it correctly on here. All right, so now we're going to look at the two one eighth inch topping slab. Well, that's right here. Okay, so here's your topping slab. Which is essentially just concrete, unreinforced, and it's poured on top, uh, usually unreinforced, and it's poured right on top of the structural slab. Well, this leaves, and he mentions that it's nine and a half inches thick structural slab. Well, that leaves this portion right here as a core right through the structural slab. I'll just call it slab, but it's actually, we know it's the structural slab. Well, if this area up here is the top, and this area over here is the bottom, okay, then this rebar that we're looking at right here is part of the, what we call the top mat. Um, if you remember when I was showing you the, uh, the cross sections just a few minutes ago, how we had the rebar at the top and then there's rebar at the bottom, this would be the rebar at the top and we actually can't see any of the rebar at the bottom. That's, that's not a big deal for this core. It just means they missed it when they did the core. Uh, this is a steel uh, a tie or stirrup. Um, it probably was used as a, what we call a chair which is something that would have been installed in the job before the concrete was placed in order to hold this rebar up so that it doesn't fall to the ground. Um, I don't see a lot of significance with this chair right now or with this piece of uh, smooth steel. But the one thing I want you to look at is I want you to look at the fact that this is all fractured and broken apart here, okay? And I also want you to note how fractured and broken it is around where the layer of steel is, all right? Now, let's look at another core. So here's core B. And again, I'm gonna save you uh, uh, some of the time on this and we're gonna breeze through some of these things. You have a stampcrete topping, which just basically means it's concrete, uh, for, for, but, it, but it's stamped at the top to have a decorative look, so it looks like brick. All right, but here's just basically its topping slab. Okay, and then here is your structural slab. 
So we can see that uh, the structural slab they measured here as 10 and a quarter inches. There's no waterproofing. This location is over near the parking area. All right, but, but more importantly, what I wanna focus on is the, the concrete slab itself. So, or the core itself, I mean. So here's the top of the slab and here's the bottom of the slab. And, and, and one of the things I want you to note is just how broken up the slab is, or this core is, I'm sorry. And these aren't clean breaks. Like if you're pulling a core out of the concrete and the contractor accidentally breaks the core, it's usually a clean break and you can literally piece them right back together like Legos. This is missing, this is missing material here and this is missing material here. And more importantly, where the top layer of steel is, we're missing a lot of material around this. And to me, that's very indicative of a, a spalling around the top mat of steel. Okay. Uh, they took another core uh, over on the other side of the building, on the side that, that, uh, that did not collapse. But again, I wanted to show you some interesting things on this core. Um, before we get into the, to the next slide, I'll just point out that the coring drills can core through rebar. I mean, here's, here's a piece of rebar right here um, that they cored right through. Okay. Uh, but again, uh, if you notice this, and I'm going to use this picture because it's a little bigger. If you notice this cracked area right here, you'll notice that there's a piece of rebar also here. So that rebar was going, you know, this way, and this rebar was going this way. And so these, these are, you know, crisscross uh, rebars. And so you can see that generally this is where the bottom rebar mat is though. And you can see that it is all cracked up in here, okay? So uh, looking at this, you have the two and three eighths inch thick stamp crete again. So here's your topping slab, your stamp crete, they call it topping slab. Again, non-structural, doesn't really matter. It just adds dead weight to the slab. Uh, what does matter is that there was no waterproofing, right? And we've talked about that before. Okay, and then here is your 10 and, uh, I think a 10 and a half inch structural slab. So that's the core of your actual structural slab. Uh, we talked about the bottom reinforcement in the previous slide. But again, here's your top mat of reinforcement. And here's your bottom of the core to orient yourselves so at the top mat reinforcement you can see again just how much material is missing around this this isn't a clean break this is you know wearing off chipping and and loss of material and to me it looks like concrete spalling uh, a, a result of concrete spalling around that rebar now to also give you an example that most cores when you pull them out don't normally break on you um, I wanted to show you the uh, two other cores that they took where they took just of topping slab. So this has no reinforcement in it. It's just a topping slab. And you can see they removed an eight inch core here, uh, which is core E1 on their report. And then they removed another core here, which is almost six inches long. And neither of these cores are broken. But then again, they don't have any steel in them that would have been corroding and expanding. Okay. So getting back to this 3D isometric view of our shear head. We mentioned that all these blue dots would have been the top rebar, okay? And they would have provided a lot because in order for this slab to fall, again, you have to break every single one of these locations of rebar you have to break. That's a lot of rebar, okay? Uh, if I, I think I did it up, it's 22, like just for in this picture, I'm saying it's 22 locations um, where you would have to break that rebar in order to get this slab to fail and come down. But if the top of your slab has actually gotten 30 and 40 years of, oh, 40 years we know, of, of, of water intrusion and damage, and the top of the layer is essentially delaminated, okay, from the, uh, from the lower portion, then the top layer, when you, when you figure in your shear plane, you, you're, you're gonna break and you're going to fail when, once you get to where it's spalled you're not going to actually even reach that upper layer of steel, right? So what you really are left with is a structural surface like this. Now, when you're calculating the shear of concrete, concrete tends to like to shear at, at 45 degree angles. I mean, it, there's a lot of factors that go into this. I know some structural engineers, are, their heads are gonna explode, but generally speaking for the layperson, they break at angles so you can imagine them at 45 degree angles. Of course, there are other contributing factors to that. But without any top steel, you can ask the question, well, why would it crack this way, okay, and go through all of this extra rebar here when maybe it can find a path like this, 
which is more economical and requires less uh, uh, energy and force to cause the, the, the failure of the slab and for the slab to come down, okay? So going back, here's what they designed, here's what the design engineer intended each of these columns to, to uh, have to break in order to fail. But if the top layer of the slab at the pool deck and then around the building in general um, is actually delaminated like I just showed, uh, then really this is all the steel that you have to work with, okay? And I drew a red line in here already, but this shows you, you know, if, if this is assuming that this top layer is essentially useless to you because it has already spalled off of that top matter rebar, that top matter rebar won't help you anymore. And what will happen is, as this, I'll show you, as the slab collapses, essentially that rebar would just push out of the way, but it's not going to act as part of your shear plane. So now you've gone down from 20, uh, let's see, it was 22 pieces of rebar that you have to break, and now you're down to six. So this is a significant decrease in shear punching strength caused by chloride attack, water damage and rusting, you can see just how fast and how weak this concrete uh, uh, shear head can get in this situation. And so then what happens is that the top layer is delaminated, okay, and the slab is going to punch through, the punch through would, would look something more like this, where the slab comes down, okay, so here's your, your slab, and again, I'm not showing the overburden anymore, but here's your slab, here's your column, this has already failed, all right, in this picture. And what you would expect is if the top of the, of the uh, um, concrete slab is actually delaminated where the top rebar is this, is, this is the cover over that rebar, then you would expect that top to shear and pop up like this. Because essentially, a portion of this up here on top of your column is part of this slab here. And so it was left up top, but the topping not being bonded to anything, you would expect it to have to break and then heave up. That's what we call heaving, okay? And so, so if, if, if the surface is delaminated and, and that is what contributed to the punching shear failure at the pool deck, then we would reasonably expect to see that. Well, do we see that? That's the question we want to ask. Well, if you go back and you look through the photos um, of Surfside, you, of the Champlain Tower South, I mean, you will see exactly that. You'll see that the, the slab is buckled up here, but you have no shear head. And you'll see that the slab is heaving here, right? And you, you really have, I mean, part of this is still sitting on the slab, but you have no shear head. I mean, you have nothing else coming out from this column, right? And we've seen that in, in the other pictures. There are no, there are no tops to these, these columns. There's no shear head here, it's missing, right? And then, of course, you can see uh, right above my head here, you can see a little bit of this also uh, heaving up. All right. So looking at these columns from a different angle, in this photo, you can see it very clearly. You've got this, what appears to be topping slab heaving up. And here you've got the same thing. And I actually zoom in on this to show you guys why I believe this is topping slab and not the whole structural slab heaving up. If you look at the at the background, okay, here is the top of the pavers of the portion that remained, that didn't fall, and here's the bottom. And from the cores, we know that the top, the topping, the, the pavers and the sand and all that stuff is about this much material, okay? Which means that the rest of this is your structural deck, okay? But if you look at the portion that is heaved and leaning against the column, you can actually see that it is not very thick at all. In fact, it's about the thickness that we would expect if we're only dealing with the overburden here, uh, plus, the, um, plus the topping that delaminated from the steel. So this is why, it, to me, it looks like the, the, uh, the, the, the top mat of steel over time delaminated. Now, go back to my walkthrough of the garage and I told you that the slabs looked like they were in distress. Well, you can imagine that if, if, if you have two columns here, okay, I'm gonna draw it real simple, and you've got a slab that's designed to be approximately 10 inches thick, nine and a half, 10 inches thick, and you really need that top steel as part of the strength of that, of that structure, but you don't have it, okay? And instead, you've got some broken, spalled off top because the top has delaminated. 
you can see that now it's relying on less steel. It's going to sag more because you've lost, uh, for the, you engineers out there, you've lost some of your compressive face. All right, that's not doing anything for you anymore. And so the slab is going to sag more, which means you're going to end up with more cracks in the slab due to stress. So that goes back to the garage walkthrough and I saw all those cracks and that's why I said, man, that really looks like a slab that's in distress. If you look at the way that the slabs punched through or the, con the concrete columns punched through the slab, to me, it's indicative of, um, of, this, of this top layer delaminating. And so they all, all of this sort of seems to point to the same causal, uh, same causalities. Okay. So that really covers it for this video. Hopefully you guys learned something about punching shear and, and why it matters and how it contributed and how maybe aging of the building and, and maybe neglect, I don't know, contributed to the failure of these pool decks. Uh, in my next video, what I really wanna talk about is um, something that I think you guys will find really interesting, which is why did the other half of the building not fall? And why did the build portion of the building that did collapse, why did it progress, uh, uh, collapse in what we call a progressive collapse, where you have single elements failing and then other elements keep failing? Why does it fail like a domino effect, okay? Uh, and then what I'm gonna do also, because you guys have been sending me a lot of uh, comments and sending me emails and things, which is great, I appreciate that. Um, one of the other things I wanna try to cover in another future video is um, when you look through the, the, the design drawings and you look at the photos and the way the building was built, I want to try to answer some questions. Was the building designed bad? Was it designed uh, weak? And or and or was the building built weak? Uh, and, and did they not put in the rebar where they were supposed to? Or did they not pour the slab like they were supposed to? So that's going to be a future video as well. Well, anyway, that'll do it for this video. I appreciate you guys watching as always. Take care.